Welcome to the second ever live taping of the Lacrosse Show, brought to you by the Lacrosse Network and Lax All Stars. With me, as always, Mr. Mark Powers. How you brought doing, Mark? Brought to you by the Lacrosse Network and Lax. Oh, yep, yep. Got to look for that. How are you, Mark? How are things? Mark oh. seems to be doing pretty well. He's doing he's doing well, I think. Response. I'm doing excellent. I just figured out the whole mute thing, so I am good to go. <laughs> that was good. You can't see us, but we can see you. Samir, how you doing? I'm doing fantastic. Uh, happy to be on again. Happy to be in California where we aren't getting you know two feet of snow. Yeah, we might get a little bit more tomorrow. It's exciting. But yeah. uh, as much as everybody loves talking about the weather. Yeah, which I do. Yeah, no, I mean, it's a great time. Everybody enjoys it. Let's dive right into the lacrosse action. Uh, Mark, from the past weekend, a bunch of D1 games. Anything uh, stand out to you? Anything Anything big? Any of your predictions come correct? Uh, not so much on the prediction front, but kind of as we were discussing, I think that Colgate-Bryant game not only ended up being exactly what we thought it was going to be, a close game between two two great teams at this point. You know, we were talking about how Brian is an up-and-comer in the Northeast or the Northeast 10, whatever their conference is. Um, and then on top of it, you really saw the uh, the new rules being implemented in the last minute there. So that was probably the biggest takeaway, being being the close game um, and, and also, you know, being a, uh, a game we saw the rules come into play. What did you think? Yeah, I mean, uh, A, I thought, you know, we, we both thought that that was going to be a fantastic game, and it was. Not a huge surprise. I think Brian is for real. You know, Colgate's a good team. They they have a lot of a lot of talent out there. Uh, so I, you know, I really like what Brian was doing. But you know, let's talk about the game that everybody saw: the ESPNU game, Siena Hopkins. I mean, this game last year it wasn't really in doubt. This year it's not really in doubt. You know, it's not a game that people are necessarily saying, "Well, this is in doubt." But I do remember last year watching that game, and by about you know the middle of the second quarter, maybe third quarter. It was kind of boring, you know. This year, yeah. it would turn out to be a blowout. I mean, Hopkins won by nine. But I enjoyed that right up until the end. I mean, I thought there was a lot of back-and-forth action. Yes, Hopkins was killing them. But, you know, I'd rather see Hopkins beat Sienna 15-6 as opposed to 9-5. No, agreed. Agreed. And, and I think that, um, to an extent, the, uh, the rules that were engineered to speed up pace of play certainly made a difference here. Um, you know, like you said, obviously Hopkins and Siena aren't necessarily on the same plane as far as, you know, their ability is concerned. But this was a prime example to me, especially with Hopkins. They were a team that was basically being uh, legislated against in the new rules. You know, I think a lot of people were kind of, you know, frowning on their style of play, slowing the ball down, being very decisive. And you saw Hopkins come out in their first game and admittedly against, you know, a little bit of a lesser opponent. But they still came out, played fast. You know, played played hard, got up and down the field. Um, it was certainly, to me, proof positive that there is, uh, you know, some validity in the new rules. I really liked what I saw. I, I agree with you. Yeah, I mean, the last part that I would add in for Hopkins was, you know, it wasn't a total departure from their controlled, kind of slowed down a little bit style of play. Uh, it was just they were forced to play a little faster. They were forced to go to the cage a little bit more, you know, but they still were able to hold the ball you know, kind of play Hopkins lacrosse to a certain extent. You know, you, you can't do it quite as much. So I like yeah. that. It's not like we all of a sudden we, there's a totally different team on the field. You still knew what you were going to get. But the pace of play, to me, seemed to be improved. Um, you know what was even, uh, I'm sorry, finish your thought. No, no, I mean, that was it. So what, what I was thinking, more, more so than anything with Hopkins, is in the past they're a type of team that would really get it in the box, get that step in, and really work, work their offense. And this time, more than ever before, you really saw them pushing the transition opportunities. You know, with Pellegrino at the pole, I know Durkin took a couple shots. You know, Castronova was moving the ball well, ran again in transition. And that's really what you want to see, that up and down part of the game, you know, that really has helped coin the term the fastest game on two feet. I, I, I think good things are in store for sure. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that that's definitely true. Uh, Samir, what you, would you think about the game? You know, I, I thought it was a lot of fun to watch. Uh, I, I really missed NCAA lacrosse, and it, it was great to have it on. been watching a lot of box lacrosse, and it was great to see uh, some field lacrosse, especially from a team like Hopkins, to get to watch, you know, those guys that you're, you're talking about, Zach Palmer, uh, Castronova, uh, um, uh, Ranigan, who I, who I love, Guida. 
um, and uh, Wells Stanwick. I thought it was fantastic to watch them, and I was actually pretty impressed with Sienna's play. To be Agreed. honest, yeah, I, and I I didn't see the rules really. I don't know, change the game too much to me. The one thing I did notice was just the the sidelines and the balls on the sidelines. I thought that that was a little bit faster. I thought, you know, the goalie coming out of the cage, I think all the goalies have to get used to that. But otherwise, I, I thought it was a great game to watch. And, and uh, you know, I, I'm a big Virginia fan, so I just can't wait till Virginia gets on ESPN. Go Hoos, baby. Go Hoos. <laughs> and we gotta give uh, we got to give some shout-outs to everybody who is tuned in. Thank you for tuning in. Um, we're get, giving a shout out to Jack and Luke, um, and they're asking about the thoughts on the Duke versus Jacksonville game. Any wow. thoughts on that game? Uh, I, you know, I'd much rather talk about Duke Denver, but Duke yeah. Jacksonville, sure. Um, no, you, know, you know, you know what? Duke Denver is definitely a game to talk about, especially because local kid Eric Adamson from Southern California went out and scored, had five goals and an assist in that game. And I think that it was phenomenal to see. We were all excited uh, out here about that. And what a great comeback from Denver. No, for sure. For sure. And, and you're right. That that's great to see, you know, a Southern California guy. I mean, Denver is one of these teams that really prides itself on having a lot of variety in the makeup of its team. Um, and most importantly for them, you know, especially losing Matthews and Demopolis, you know, they, they needed to figure out where their scoring was going to come from. And, you know, it's clear that Westberg, Noble, Flint, and Law can't do everything all the time, especially when you have a, uh, you know, a fast physical defense in Duke. So, you know, I, I think that, you know, um, Adamson showing up really bodes well for Denver, him, and also the freshman, uh, Gordy Korber, Kerber from yeah. Gilman. Bo- both of them having good performances. I, I think the sky's the limit for Denver this year. Yeah, I mean, for me, it came back to what we were talking about earlier, and, and that is, uh, you know, people want to kind of write off Duke uh, early when they lose a game or two. You know, it's, it's tough when it's to a team like Denver. Um, you know, somebody's got to lose that game. But I think Duke, you know, it's clear that all the pieces are there. Uh, with Denver, I mean, they seem to be flying high right away, good goalkeeping, defense has improved. You know, I mean, you saw that by the second half of that game, that the defense was playing better. So, um you know, as far as the Duke-Jacksonville game goes, I mean, you know, Duke won. Uh, you know, a win's a win. You know, you kind of take it at this point. Um, go ahead. One thing that I really like to bring up about Jacksonville, Connor and I were talking about Jacksonville earlier this year, and maybe the big news coming out of uh, coming out of Florida right now isn't so much the Duke-Jacksonville game, but more the developments that are happening with, with their new conference. And I think yeah, that really goes well. That's big. That's big. I mean, humongous. I mean, that's that's absolutely ridiculous. I mean, you're now going to see an automatic qualifier that's coming very soon. I mean, apparently they've, they've skipped the waiting period, and starting in 2014, when, when some of those teams are fully accredited, they're going to have an AQ, and I, I think that's the big story coming out of down south. I mean, obviously, Jacksonville happens to be in a conference, I think, with VMI right now. They're in the MAC, and, and they have access to the AQ, you know, not necessarily realistic that they'd win it, but, you know, now moving forward, looking at 2014, that's going to be ridiculous. And, and to me, not only is it great that the Southern Conference or the, those Southern teams, you know, that are now new to the game will have an AQ so you'll get to see them more, but also this might be a harbinger that, that the tournament might be expanding too. Yeah, I mean, it certainly might be. To go as an independent, which some of those teams are doing right now, uh, you know, up against a team like Hopkins, that's a really tough road, you know. Uh, the AQ would be huge. So I, what I and I, what I think the deal is with that is that they've waived the the one year waiting period, or, you know, whatever it is, so they can apply next year for the automatic qualifier. Whether or not they're granted the AQ in year one, I think is another question that hasn't been oh, answered. Oh, okay. Yet. Yeah. So I think that you know, but the chances are pretty good. And, and if you're at one of those six schools, or if you're the NCAA, you got to be saying this is going to be great to draw quality kids. You know, you have a much better chance competing against that group, you know, other relatively new programs and VMI, which has been somewhat of a, a consistent bottom dweller. Um, you know, you've got a much better, you know, chance of getting to a tournament bid if you're if you're a kid. So, you know, for me, I think that that's a huge, huge boost for every single one of the schools in that conference. I mean, Mercer, Furman, High Point, like these are teams. You know, Jacksonville. You, you got to look at them right now, and, and probably High Point as as the two favorites, but that could change, you know, tomorrow. What do you think, Samir? 
How about High Point? That's pretty cool. Yeah. I yeah. thought that was awesome. But yeah, uh, yeah I got to I got to give a couple shout outs here before we carry on. Uh, a lot of shout outs. Greg tuning in. Uh, Greg Poop. Greg Poop, that's his name. He says, "Can you give me a shout out? It would make my day." Uh, there's your shout out, and we Mark said your name too, your full name. I didn't expect that. Um, <laughs> but otherwise, I mean, about the college game, you know, I, I think uh, it's so great to see somebody like High Point come in and, and have such a big win. Um, but then you think about, you know, something we talked about here at TLN was about Michigan. You know, how, how does Michigan feel that that it's been, uh, you know, a year and, and maybe it's a slower process for Michigan than it is for High Point? How do you compare the two programs? Wow. Great question. That's that's amazing. You know what's interesting? You know, you think back. I, I hate to go back to Jacksonville talking about Michigan, but both the both Jacksonville and High Point, two two Southern teams in their first year, both have pretty signature wins. So High Point just took out Towson, and then in their first year, I'm pretty sure Jacksonville took out Denver when Denver was on a road trip. So those are two big big wins for them in their first year. Um, yeah, M- Michigan. You know, I, I think their road is a little different in that they came from being a club team. You know, so they, in, in quote-unquote year one or team one, were composed pretty much of uh, of club players with a couple transfers thrown in. And you're really just starting to see their recruiting classes come about. Whereas with these other teams, Jacksonville and High Point, those are true Division One recruiting classes where they're offering scholarships and, you know, different opportunities. And, you know, as, as much as you don't want to talk about it, the weather certainly plays a factor, too. I mean, these teams can practice all the time being down south. I mean, I know Michigan I mean, has a great indoor facility, but yeah, at the I think same those time, you got to be realistic. you got to be realistic, too. You know, on the long term, for me, who's a winner in this, Jacksonville and High Point or Michigan? You know, i got to go with Michigan. Uh, of course. You know, obviously, you got the field house and, and the draw, you know, being a Wolverine, I think is really big. You know, and then you start getting those those teams like Penn State. I mean, Penn State, I think, is due to be a top 10 team this year, you know, and, and probably for years to come. I think they're going to be an awesome program. So when you throw those schools in, you know, and, and God forbid for the Northern schools, a big-time Southern sports school goes serious to lacrosse. I mean, that could be a game changer. So yeah, Like USC. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, USC would be a great example. If they came in, I mean, kids would flock to go to the University of Southern California, no question about it. Okay, and look, I, I got to bring something up. I'm, you know, I'm, I come from a USC family. I'm a big Trojan fan. But uh, Connor on, on Lax All-Stars, on Southland Lax, I saw pictures from the USC LMU game. What were your thoughts on those USC helmets? <laughs> I I don't know. I'm a I'm a Trojan fan, but that really I kind of the Argyle shorts. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I, the whole thing. What's going on over there? First of all, I want to say that in 2007, my Wesleyan alumni team wore those shorts. So, okay. um, good on you, USC. I think that that was an excellent choice. Way to research my alumni team from five years ago. Good job. Um, no, I, you know, on a serious note, you know, it, it, honestly, it's club lacrosse, and that means that the kids have a say in what they wear. And if they, and if a team want, wants to wear wacky, wild stuff, I'm all for that. You know, yeah. when you get Especially to be a Southern NCAA California team, team. yeah, well, but when you get to be a, you know, an NCAA team, and you know, it's top down, the administration's telling you what to wear and logos and all that. You know, some club lacrosse teams can't even use their school's logos. So if they want to go, you know, if they want to go wild with your uniforms or however they're approaching things. They're, I mean, first of all, they're paying for it, so they can do whatever they want. But, you know, for a team like USC, I mean, I, I thought the helmet was creative. It was something different. Um, it, you know, probably didn't break the bank. It's like a typical head wrap kind of deal, but certainly. Plus, we're talking it. about it. <laughs> yeah. That's true. We're talking about it. Just wish it was someone else. Yeah. <laughs> Agreed. Uh, you know, one thing you, you were bringing up club lacrosse, and it kind of made me think about what we were talking about with Michigan and, you know, it might be a little bit of a cheap shot, but, um, you know, to an extent, I, I think it's worth talking about that, that Michigan is playing with John Paul, who, you know, is, is a, you know, respected lacrosse mind, but at the same time is a guy without Division One experience. And, you know, you compare him with John Torpy da- down at High Point, you know, who was a guy who, who was a coach in waiting, and now you've got Chamati down at Richmond, and I think, um, if, um, what is it, Van Arsdale or, or one of them is, is down in Jacksonville. And, th- and these are established names. So, you know, I, I think that probably also played into their help. Sorry to, to go back to that, but just bringing up the club thing made me think about it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that might be fair and it, and it might not be because, 
for me, there are certain head coaches at the D1 level who, you know, they're kind of like more of an organizer. And I don't mean to, you know, belittle Coach Paul at all or, or what he can, you know, kind of bring to the coaching table. Uh, but the ability to bring in top flight assistance, I think, makes a huge difference. Um, you know, you got a guy who runs your offense, a guy who runs your defense, maybe your big picture, uh, you know, kind of focusing on the day-to-day -day stuff. And I, I think he can excel there. So, you know, I don't know that you necessarily have to be the top X's and O's guy for your team to be good. You know, can you attract talent? Again, I think Michigan can attract talent. You know, and the great thing about John Paul is, I mean, the, the alumni, the school, the students, they all seem to be huge fans. You know, and he's really got that thing going. So I think you got to give him a shot. And, again, like you said, you're going from a roster of almost all club guys. Um, right. I think it just speaks to why they maybe didn't not. have initial success. That's all. Yeah, yeah. No, I think you're right. I think it probably does have something to do with that. Um, you know, again, they're, they're playing some tough teams too. Well, okay, so we have some questions now. Uh, first of all, Kevin Rowan says – come out to see those helmets in person this weekend at the Pac-12 shootout at UCLA. That's true. There is a Pac-12 shootout at UCLA, which I think is a great event. I think it's cool to see all those uh, big-name schools in one place. They'll be playing. Uh, you know, I'll be over there. Um, and we're actually streaming a game from there, the Cal ASU game. Which should be oh, that good. should be great. Yeah, that should be a, a, a really fun one. Samir, now, how, how intense is the USC-UCLA lacrosse rivalry? Not, from what I know, I don't, I don't know much about it. When I was a kid, I went to a game. It didn't seem that intense. I know that now it's, it's heated up a little bit more. Now, you know, both programs are, have kind of gotten, you know, better and better. And, and I know UCLA is, it has definitely gotten better. Uh, Kevin Rowan, if you want to speak to that, you can send us a comment. Uh, talk They're too about busy that. going to Coachella. They're, they are too busy going to Coachella, exactly. I mean, that is, that is <laughs> the bottom line. That at USC, they, you know, it is club lacrosse. And I think uh, Coachella, especially – being just a couple hour drive away is is a, is a tough one, but let's see. And now there's a lot of questions here about NCAA lacrosse. Sure. Um, you know let's about rapid fires, Mark. You you are required to answer every question in 15 seconds or less. All right, Perfect. here we go. Let's do it. Uh, predictions for towards and finalists this year. I gotta go with Baum. I know that's easy. I had earlier said Hawkins, but I'm gonna go with Baum. All right, and another West Coaster. Uh, breakout player of the year. Switching up your prediction already? Yeah, I mean, two and two in the first game. I, I got to like what I'm seeing. Uh, breakout player. Wow, that's a great question. Uh, I'm going to say whoever really surfaces on that Virginia attack, you know, it, 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 whoever, whoever comes to play there. I don't think it's necessarily going to be a freshman. Maybe, uh, maybe a midi. Okay. Bobby Tyler of UMass. Wow. Oh, you picked the guy that scores five goals week one? <laughs> no, I think he had four assists, right? Oh, okay. Yeah, plus he plays with traditional, so uh, I'm obviously biased. Next. Favorite colors. That's from John. John Kellier. Blue. Well, purple, purple's a regal color, so that has, uh, you know, just, just natural flair for me. But my, my colors for, uh, for high school were, uh, were maroon and black, so I'm going with that. All right. Here's another question. I don't think uh, – I'm not sure how you guys are going to respond to it. Here's a question. Will Manny and UMass? Love them both. There's a, there's a question mark. So, Love them both. I, I worry that Will Manny won't necessarily have another Tawaratan caliber year, but clearly they're off to a great start. I mean, we, we spoke pretty extensively about what we thought was going to happen in that game. I don't think that he necessarily capitalized – on his individual matchup and, and didn't fill up the score sheet, but clearly he doesn't have to. And, and as Connor astutely pointed out, there are some new faces up in Amherst that, that are looking to, uh, to hit the field hard. All right. I think that kind of concludes our, our rapid fire. We'll get back to that. We do have a, uh, a personal question for me here, and I think it'd be great to, to bring this uh, to the whole group. But the, the question is, uh, Samir, what was your lacrosse career like high school to college and how did you get where you are now and I think that'd be uh interesting you know Connor I've been reading Black's All-Stars since I was uh in college and sending you photos since I was uh in college hoping that they would get posted on uh, Black's All-Stars so I, I think that's that's an interesting uh thing to just just talk about how did you how did you get involved in, in lacrosse journalism uh, I, I was actually working uh, for the city of New York and then started writing a little bit on my in my own free time and uh, got 
connected through Chris Mead and Matt Wheeler of Lacrosse Recruits, who I played with at Wesleyan in college. Uh, met Jeff and Ryan Craven, who were doing Lax All Stars. They had, they had started that a couple of years ago, and uh, I hopped on with them, and uh, that that's been the story ever since. Nice. And Mark Bowers, what what brings you onto the screen today? And just in general, how do you uh, tell us about your career and, and how you got? How, how do how do I fit in? Uh, yeah, I, I guess I'm a, a prototypical uh, lax rat, as it were. Although I hate that term, but how how did I find my way ever so slightly into lacrosse journalism? So, uh, as some of you may know, I, I helped uh, CJ in uh, putting together the Salt Shakers in its infancy, and, and was actually you know really one of the main guys sending out um, information. Actually, Connor. Connor was the first guy to ever publish anything, you know, about our club, you know, talking about the fact that, you know, we play for breast cancer research. And, you know, I'll never forget CJ and I talking that first weekend and all of a sudden the Facebook likes start going up through the roof. You know, we started getting like, you know, hundreds upon hundreds of people friending us and, you know, just kind of rolled from there. And, and then obviously meeting Connor here in New York uh, really lent itself. And then, you know, naturally, you know, had, had, to, had to bring our talents to TV, right? Yeah. Well, you guys are definitely TV guys now. But, uh, yeah, to answer the question, you know, I grew up in Los Angeles, which is not traditionally a lacrosse hotbed, um, started playing and, and uh, you know, went to school and studied film and digital media and got to play up there uh, in, at UC Santa Cruz in the MCLA. And through kind of studying digital media, just really wanted to, um, you know, have more media around lacrosse. I wanted to watch more lacrosse and I wanted to have more lacrosse programming, so it wasn't available, so we decided to just uh, create it and, and create something like this. So I guess that's the that's a long story short. We have uh, some more questions, and uh, one one thing I did want to just quickly address was Luke Rice Lax. Where do you play? Because maybe I'll show up at one of your games. Uh, <laughs> now let's see, Kyle Patterson. Uh, you know, an interesting question here. He asked MLL or NLL, and a couple uh, questions up. There's a question about the LXM Pro Tour. And I'm just curious how you guys, what you guys think about, you know, we talked about college, but now we to talk about the, the Pro Tour and, and the Pro Leagues in general and, uh, you know, what the progression is for, for these college athletes and to, to go on and, and play in, a, in professional leagues and, and when there's multiple professional leagues. You know, we talked about the NALL last, last week. Um, and, and what your guys' thoughts are on just uh, professional lacrosse. Connor, why don't you take that? You know, I'm certainly a fan of the concept. Uh, I, I do think that we are still some time away from professional lacrosse being, you know, a, a financially viable kind of deal for, you know, players and coaches and, and everybody involved, arenas, fields, stadiums, you know, whatever the case may be. So I, I do think we're some time away from that, and that has to do with the growth of the sport, how many people have played, how many people are fans, how many people are watching. And, you know, lacrosse all-stars, the lacrosse network, all that helps us get there. And I think that the MLL knows that. Um, you know, I don't think that they were operating under the impression that they were going to turn a profit in year one or that they were going to necessarily turn a profit in year five or to year 10 or year 15 or year 20. Um, you know, I, I think that to a certain extent they might be saying, you know, it, it's going to get there, but we have to grow it, uh, and, and you do have to grow things. So, you know, I, I like seeing things in their infancy. I, I worry sometimes that people expect almost too much from a league like the MLL. You know, these guys aren't full-time athletes, and, they, and they, you know, they don't practice uh, with the team, you know, week long to prep for a game. Um, you know, and you can see that from time to time. Again, I still think it's a great product, and it's a lot of fun to watch. So, you know, I'm a big fan of pro lacrosse. I think it has a ways to go in terms of surpassing college. But, you know, all these different guys trying different things between the NALL, CLAX, NLL, MLL, LXM, you know, you have a lot of options. So I think there are going to be some best practices that people will find. And, you know, these leagues may merge into something different down the road. But, you know, I like seeing it. I, I don't think it's where it will be, you know, 10 years from now. I, I think it's going to be a totally different ball game. Yeah, agreed. I mean, to me, I think that any pro lacrosse is, is good for the sport, no question about it. Um, as far as which I probably prefer, um, I might say the NLL. <laughs> I, I've been watching a lot of it recently, so maybe I'm just biased to that. Um, I've, I've caught a bunch of the LXM on, uh, on uh, the lacrosse network, and the coverage has been fantastic. I like what I see. 
Um, to me, that's that's a little bit less of a, a polished product as you know the NLL and MLL are as, as pro leagues, and I think that's on purpose. To be fair, I'm not I'm not trying to slight them in any way, um, and, and it certainly has its place. Um, but yeah, I, I think right now, to me, the caliber of lacrosse that I see in the NLL, you know, their their business model to an extent, you know, their um, their attendance numbers are up this year, pretty much everywhere. I, I really like the product that they're putting out there, and, and I think that they're being pretty smart about it. Um, and, and I think MLL knows what they're doing too. You know, they're starting to put a better and better product out there. Um, and like like I said before, I'd just like to reiterate that all pro lacrosse is, is good for the game. No question. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, we've been a big fan of, uh, of, of watching all of it, you know, between the NLL, uh, the MLL, as, and, you know, the LXM Pro Tour, which is a, a really fun tour to, to watch. So, so Samir, you, you probably have a better insight into, into LXM than, than either Connor or I being out, being out on the West Coast and obviously doing a whole host of production for those events. You know, why, why don't you give us your, your verdict after year one and, and be as honest as possible, you know, because you, you've been able to get behind the scenes to an extent. Yeah, I mean, just in, about the, the Pro Tour in general? Well, yeah, you know, just kind of, you know, what did you think about the product on the field and, and what do you think about the experience, right? So, obviously, I love the fact that they're, that they're partnering up with, with youth tournaments, kind of building, an, uh, you know, a set audience that comes with it. Um, and, and, I, and I like that model, you know, just not being able to have seen one of these events in person. You know, why, why don't you tell us a little bit about what it's like and, and kind of what, what you've seen and, and, and were you satisfied with what you saw in year one? Sure, yeah. I mean, I, I think for me growing up, Kyle Harrison and, and Mike Powell were two guys I really looked up to, especially Mike Powell, um, just because, of, you know, I mean, unbelievable athlete, a great attackman. And, and to be able to see both of those guys play on the same field uh, is amazing. It, it, it's really fantastic. And to be able to see Kyle play, you know, on a consistent basis, for me, I, I, I love it. Um, I think that the experience in general of, of them partnering with Adrenaline and, and doing, uh, you know, the Adrenaline ATS events is, is great. And if you have an opportunity to get out to one, I, I would really recommend it. Because, you know, you're around – you're physically with, you know, at the LXM Challenge in Del Mar, we were with 7,000 kids who uh, all play lacrosse. And, yeah, and, you're just immersed. Yeah, and you're just immersed in it. You get to watch everybody play. Um, you get to, to be around them, have a toss with a ton of kids. And then you have the guys out there uh, who these kids, you know, have role models that they can look up to and they can interact with. Um, I think the best part about the tour is, is the clinics and the um, kind of instructional stuff that goes on between – you know, you can go up to, to Sam Bradman. You can ask him questions. He's running a shooting clinic, you know, where there's going to be 50 kids checking it out. But afterwards, he's available for you. You can sign an autograph. He can uh, play Bago, which a lot of them did, uh, playing, you know, different games like that, just having a good time. So I think it's just – it brings in this cool community aspect to the tour. And it, it, it really felt like traveling with the tour especially, felt like we were traveling with uh, – you know, I, I don't even know, like a traveling circus or something where everybody kind of knows everybody by the end and it's all a big community. And, and uh, I thought that aspect of it was really cool. You know, That's I, awesome. I, it's great to hear. As well, I mean, the lacrosse on the field, you get to see guys like Eric Crum uh, and Sam Bradman play, and, and that's awesome to see. So I, I thought it was great. But, again, you know, the same thing as the MLL. They're not practicing together every day. They don't have, uh, you know, that, they don't have set practices, set, set plays that they're running, everything like that. Like, you get to see when you see Hopkins play. So I think, in general, the, the, the great aspects of it are that you're traveling and, and they can kind of pick up this, this game and take it to different destinations, um, which I think is great. It's not, it's not married, you know, the, the Team STX is not married to, to one location. Right. That's awesome. But, you know, I think there is something also to be said about having, you know, a Philadelphia team, which is so cool. So, I think... Yeah, that's but you know what, to an extent, um, you know, uh, Connor and I have talked about this in the past, and, you know, MLL is certainly building towards that, um, you know, that kind of fan affinity. Uh, you know, granted, we're kind of jaded being a little older and having a different perspective on the league. But, like, for me, for example, when I tune into MLL, even though I'm from New York, I'm not necessarily rooting for the Long Island Lizards, right? The same way I'm rooting for the University of Virginia. Like, I, I just want to see a good lacrosse game, see some great action, and I hope that soon it will come to the point where I'm so passionate about, 
the uh, the New York Lizards that I can't imagine them losing to Boston the same way you know I I have that feeling about the Red Sox or the Patriots or any one of these you know Godforsaken uh, teams from up there. <laughs> <laughs> wow! Wow! Oh, yeah! Wow! You know the Seri- deal. You know the deal. Serious, serious hatred. You know what it is, New England. But that's cool. Yeah, we're not gonna we won't worry about that too much. Point of fact, I went to Boston College, so you know I gotta I gotta, I gotta at least tell the truth there. <laughs> Well, I think the one big thing for, you know, especially for the MLL is, you know, when you don't have guys necessarily being traded, when you have guys who who live in the city or region uh, of the team that they play for, you know, because they're paid enough uh, and they have to be there for practices and they live in these communities, you know, I think that that will help as well. You know, Paul Rabel is Boston's biggest star, but he lives in Baltimore. Um, You know, so – and that's not bad for Baltimore lacrosse. He's everywhere down there. But, you know, in terms of people building up, you know, a fan base for Boston, I, I think it helps to have athletes live in the city. So as you have more guys living, being able to afford to live in those areas, um, you know, and being able to make a, kind of a more full-time life out of it, I think that's going to build an affinity for the actual teams. But right yeah. now, you know, just like you see in the LXM, a lot of people cheer for a team because of a player or two, you know, that they really like. Um, you know, that, that's just the way modern sports are in general. You know, there are plenty of people who tell me, oh, I don't like the Lakers. Well, since I'm a Kobe fan, I cheer for the Lakers. Everybody yeah. likes the Lakers, Connor. No, I, I heard that don't. that's not true. I, Everybody I likes the Lakers. That's a vicious... Wait till they miss the playoffs. <laughs> <laughs> Keep Dan Tony. You could have him, baby. I think everybody watching here, probably everybody likes the Lakers, I'm assuming. Right, guys? Probably. Don't stop fishing for people to agree with you. Just <laughs> no comment. <laughs> well, by the way, there uh, there's a lot of requests here for. Yeah, for Tony, you can have them, baby. Whoa! Yeah. Let's take everybody watching here. Probably everybody likes. Mark, them. is that you? Right, guys. No, it's not me. Probably. Don't stop fishing for people to me. agree with you. Just. <laughs> you know, I bet that was me. All right. Well, we have a lot of people who are requesting for another rapid fire round. Is everybody good with that? I just sure. yeah, but I'd like to note that Craig Shaw does not like the Lakers. I don't believe that. I, I know Craig. That. He wouldn't. Craig wouldn't, wouldn't say that. Craig. Craig wouldn't say that. But yeah, I mean Joe Myers, uh, who just commented on the stream saying Lakers suck. So I don't appreciate that, Joe. Everybody likes the Lakers. All right, here we go. So we're in a uh, in a, a rapid fire round right now. So if you guys have. Questions, let's start firing them away. We'll start with the first one here. Who is going to win the NLL championship this year? Who's going to win the MLL championship this year? Connor, you first. Uh, I made this pick earlier, and I'm sticking with it. I'm going Calgary, although wow. I, don't think they're gonna, I don't know if they're going to win this weekend. Uh, they've got tough games. But uh, I'm going Calgary in the NLL. And who's going to win in the MLL? Yeah. And those teams are far from being set. Uh, so it's hard to say, but I'm, I'm going to go with the New York Lizards right now. That's a that's a long long ways out. By the yeah. Way. Mark, yeah. Lot, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to say, based off of what they what they've done early in the season and, and kind of their traditional success, uh, I'll take a kind of easy pick and say the Toronto Rock. I think would uh, you know with Rose the goalie and, and obviously the offensive players they have, they're they're looking pretty good in the NLL right now. Uh, but I do like Calgary with Poulin in, go, in goal. Um, for me, for the MLL, you did steal that New York pick from me. <laughs> It'd be easy for me to take them. Um, you know what? Why not? I'll say Boston. I, I think that they got plenty of talent coming back. It'll be interesting. Actually, you know what? Forget that. I'm going with the Hamilton Nationals. You know, they, they made another That's a move crazy tonight. pick. That's the craziest thing you've ever said. <laughs> no, it's not. And, and I'll tell you exactly why it's not. They, they, they have a team that needs to gel. But think about what they've done in the past, right? This is a team that's been to, that's been to two Steinfeld Cup championship games with much less talent than what they have now. All they did was go out and add phenomenal players all over the place. They got Hawkins. LaPierre, they got Cahill, they got, you know, defensemen up the yin-yang. You know, basically everywhere that they had a deficiency, they filled it. And on top of it, you know, they returned those other guys that matter, like Kehoe and Jameson and those Canadians that just score like crazy. So don't be surprised if you see the Hamilton Nationals sneak back into the, into another final. Oh, yeah, and they got Scott Rogers and Queener in goal. You know, it's not like they're looking like the worst team out there. I'm going to say I'm shocked that neither of us picked Chesapeake. I'm, not, I'm, I'm shocked that I didn't pick Chesapeake. Too easy. Too easy. No fun. <laughs> Too easy. 
All right, well, I'm going with Philadelphia in the NLL and Ohio in the MLL. Let's go on to the next question here. Okay, those <laughs> are the worst picks. The Philly, <laughs> yeah, the Philly one isn't that bad. The Philly one isn't that bad. They, I think they could do it. The American, the American Wings could pull it off. But <laughs> Brandon Miller for MVP. I don't know about that Ohio pick. I think that they're still a year or two away, at least, at least, Samir. I don't know. I'm, I like you dreaming I'm, big, Samir. I like you dreaming big. Yeah, I'm, I always dream big. All right. Like, give uh, me the question. second most West Coast team. <laughs> question that I could probably answer myself. Who's the coolest out of the three of you? That'd be myself. Uh, next You're question. You're the youngest. You're the you youngest. See this V-neck? The you see this V-neck? Come on, guy. Yeah, Mark is wearing a V-neck. That's true. So I might have to give that to Mark. And he did just, just uh, get a haircut, too. <laughs> so I can give that to Keep Mark. it a corporate. But uh, <laughs> high and tight. Who is going to win the Bruins-Ranger game? It's 1-0 New York right now. Rangers, no question. Come on. Bruins, Next no one. question. Bruins, got it. All right. No, it's the Rangers, no question, baby. We're due. Bobby Orr's son is going to have seven goals. <laughs> Actually, more importantly, how about Boston College? A little bean pot. I know you guys aren't up on your, your college hockey, but chalk another one up to the Eagles right there. I know that's not big on the West Coast, but these are the things that matter over here. Yeah, I don't even know what I don't know what bean pot means. Is that a that's an East Coast thing, huh? It's a yeah, Boston so, so, thing. Yeah, every every year all the Boston schools, BC, BU, Northeastern, and, and Harvard, they get together for a big hockey tournament. And once again, my alma mater, BC, took it down. You know, business even as though, usual. Even though technically you're Newton. Please, please don't Chestnut Hill. All right, don't don't worry about where the school's located. We'll take our misnomer and, and run with it. But anyway, what's what's up with the rapid fire? Yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe well, some more rapid fire. Look, I've pitched rapid fire, but you guys are elongating your answers. I know, I know. We can't get to rapid fire here, Mark. You're changing up your your answers in the middle of them. You gotta <laughs> cut us off, Samir. All right, all right, I'm gonna cut you guys off now. But I do want to address a couple things. We looks like we have a lot of bean pot fans here, and we have yeah, a. Uh, I'll be here. Yeah, we have a yeah BC winning again. Hashtag beat BU. So, all right, now I have to get. It sucks to be you. I was always I was always a BU guy. I don't yeah, know why. No I surprise. Like too. No I surprise. Even, I don't know why. All right, let's see. Uh, favorite lacrosse head of all time. Wow, Connor. Absolute silence. Uh, Brian Edge. Wow. Really? See, I, was, I was thinking that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going with an Evo. Love the Evo. Wow. All right. Well, I'm going to go with the STX Proton Power. That was the best one. Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah. See, that's I just see so many incarnations of both the Edge and the Evo. And well, actually, Proton Power, too. You know, those are three sticks that, that have really transformed over time, you know, both being pinched and then unpinched and now college legal. Yeah, I mean they they've seen all different types of styles. I I think that those are three three to stay, and we picked one from each major manufacturer. That was pretty good. Which brings us to our next rapid fire question: favorite lax brand? I gotta say Warrior it sucks, but I'll say it. <laughs> wow, they're the evil yeah. empire. It's like <laughs> the Yankees. You can go with Warrior. You can go with Warrior. That, you know that's. I know where my bread gets buttered. <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's not always, weird. It's not weird, not at all. No. <laughs> I gotta say, I don't, uh, I don't have a favorite lacrosse brand. I really don't. I don't know if I have one either. I, I like. Couldn't even, I couldn't begin to pull one out of the out of my hat. I think it depends on which category. Oh, all right. Maybe we'll go. Maybe we'll go more. Uh, yeah, whoever that, whoever asked that question, you gotta ask in more detail. What are you looking for? Gloves. Yeah, yeah. If we can break it down to category, I think we'd be good. All right. Okay. Uh, all, right. Uh, all right. Speed, footwork, or strength? Footwork. Do I have to choose? Yeah. I go with speed. I would go with uh, – if I could do a hybrid of speed and footwork, but if I had to choose one, probably footwork. Hit the jump ropes. Footwork's good. Footwork's good. It'll Can't do you real speed, though. No, yeah, no question. And, and you know what, Connor, you guys had that great video up on your website of, uh, what's his name, Alex Collins, the Arkansas recruit. I mean, good God, I never seen speed like that on a lacrosse field. That you was know, something. To, that that to showed honest, you what though, He also had good footwork. He did. Uh, 
I mean, not maybe good lacrosse footwork. Maybe it wasn't naturally good lacrosse footwork, but I think his running back instincts when he would kind of hit the hole between two or three uh, defenders on the other team, I mean, he looked like he was cutting through a hole. It was awesome. His footwork was awesome. Uh, but, yeah, I think he had all three. Probably strength, too, I would imagine. Favorite hobby besides lacrosse? There's stuff other than lacrosse. <laughs> I don't know. That's a crazy question. Making money, baby. Cash rules everything around me. <laughs> <laughs> so Wu Tang. That's a Mark's great. Marshall Wu Tang enthusiast. That's a great one. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I think it'd probably just be listening to country music. Me. You really listen to country music? Yeah, I do. I'm going to I'm going so to Stagecoach, Connor. If anybody wants to join me, going to Stagecoach. It's the weekend after Coachella. It's all country music. It'd be great. Why don't they call it Stage Coachella? That doesn't make any sense. I don't know what that is, so. <laughs> All right, CPXR or Pro 7? I'll answer that first, CPXR. I've never worn a CPXR, but i got to say I like the look. Connor? Um, uh, CPXR. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think. yeah. It's more sleek. I like it. The tail has grown on me. Yeah. Best college lacrosse coach? Current or former? Either. Oh, good question. I'm going to have to say – I'm going to go with Stargia for, uh, for current. Uh, I, I am a huge fan of uh, Dick Adele, former, former Maryland coach, so I'm going to throw that in there too. Wow. That, those are two excellent choices. I'm going to go with uh, – John Reba of Wesleyan University. <laughs> Total Homer pick. That's, That's okay. I gotta go. I gotta go with Starja. I'm just such a big fan. But you know what? I, I want to point out one guy that I think is really killing it right now, and 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 you touched on his team earlier, Jeff Tambroni. Man, I mean, he what a beast. I mean, yeah. I don't know what he's doing, putting in the water everywhere he goes. All his teams do is just get better and win. I mean, look, he's had that Penn State team for what? two years they should have been in the tournament last year he went to the the final four with Cornell for three years in a row some of those teams that definitely didn't necessarily deserve to be there he's he's killing it right now yeah and I think one other guy that you really have to single out who's obviously in the cur current college ranks um, and I don't know that he always gets well of course he does they just won a national championship but to me at Loyola uh, you know he really was willing to force that Greyhound team to do things differently, to allow D middies to attack, to attack in substituting patterns on four on fours, five on fives, when they were man down. Uh, you know, it was a very different approach than most other D1 teams were taking, not every team. Uh, but I think it took, took a while to kind of break himself of those habits and uh, break that program of those habits. And, you know, if you're a guy that can do that and kind of step outside and adjust, uh, that's pretty impressive. So he, he certainly gets a, a nod for doing that. Your pick for the best team at the FIL World Games, excluding the U.S. and Canada? Netherlands. Really? Your no point. question. Yeah, your point. I, spent some time, I spent some time in the Netherlands last year with some of the guys on the national team. Good group of guys. The sport is growing like crazy over there. They got a couple good Americans uh, you know, that, that helped them out in the past, the Zimmerman brothers. I really like the Netherlands doing their thing. They got some size, too. Some of those boys are big. Yeah. Uh, ben Van Ogen, Tim Woolbrink. I mean, those guys are 6'3", 6'4". Huge. Tim is a big monsters. boy, let me tell you. Yeah, yeah. No, they're, they're monsters. Um, I, I think that's great. You know, for me, it's got to be the Iroquois Nationals. I think there's been a resurgence in the field game uh, within that community, and, uh, you know, I think they're going to bring it in Denver in 2014, especially after what happened in 2010 in England, uh, and then yeah. not getting to play. They got eight years of pent-up field lacrosse to take out on the rest of the world. I'm looking forward to seeing it. You know what? I, I like this guy pointing out, is uh, Jared Rubin pointing out Israel. i got to say, Israel has probably had the quickest rise to relevance of, of any international team. You know, they're looking good, but it's too early to tell with them, i got to say, Jared, a little, a little too soon on that front. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see who's on their roster. Agreed. It could be all of Long Island. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm very, I'm very interested to see if we have another uh, team Long Ireland on our hands. Um, 
you know, not to say that that's necessarily a bad thing or doesn't happen in other sports. I mean, look at where some of the international soccer players end up. I mean, look at some of the uh, U.S. players' birthplaces, you know. So you got to be – I think we got to be a little bit lenient. You know, it's not a 100% born, live there your entire life. There's got to be some flexibility. No, agreed. And and you know what, to, to your point about the Iroquois, uh, you know, I, I think talking about their uh, – them being shut out in 2010 was really poignant, um, and especially what they've been doing with, with the indoor game, and just how many more how many more Native Americans are playing the sport and playing it at high levels. I really think the sky's the limit for them. And you saw it; you even saw it in the in the U19 game. I mean, they beat they beat the American team, and, and then they lost to them in a close game. And and that's not even the senior team where where arguably some of their greater talent lies. So it'll be interesting to see what what the Iroquois bring to the table. Don't be surprised if if you see them in the final. Another question here that I, I liked from Joe Myers, NCAA Final Four teams. Ooh. it's a good question. I mean, I definitely like uh, Maryland to make a strong run. I think Denver is going to be really good. Uh, I think Loyola has the, the tools to make it back. Um, and then, you know, for a fourth, uh, Notre Dame, I think defensively they're extremely strong. They've got a more potent offense this year. Um you know, strong goaltending, possibly the best in the country. So, and Notre Dame, Maryland, Loyola, Denver, uh, you know, those are kind of my top four right now. I think you can obviously look at Duke. I think UNC could make a run. Uh, Virginia's got some guys to replace, but to me they're always more of a system team. So, you know, Cornell with Rob Pinnell, I think he could take them on a run. Uh, even Peter Baum in Colgate or, or Will Maney in UMass, I mean, those are kind of more outside teams for me. But uh, I think all those those squads have a good shot. But, yeah. Uh, Notre Dame, Maryland, Loyola, Denver. I think those are uh, those are probably my top four. What about you? Any, I, any I, I like. Uh, I want to see Denver there. I really do. And I, that, you know, there's another a question that just came out that says uh, Denver's future without Mark Matthews. I'd I'd like to see Denver there. I'd like to see Virginia in that Final Four. I wouldn't mind seeing Maryland there. I don't know if they're going to be there. But then you know, I I like Loyola. I I like. Uh, uh, Mike Sawyer, I think he's a, a talented guy. He's really fun to watch. I got to give a shout out right now to Greg from East Coast Eyes who just tuned in. Um, what's up, Greg? Hey, am I back? Can you hear me? You're back. Yeah, Mark, you're back. You're I'm back. back. Did you hear my final four? Yeah, no. we can hear we can hear that V neck loud and clear actually. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> it's coming off. It's coming <laughs> off. Whoa, 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 Mark. This is a. This is a, a primetime talk show here. Yeah. Family values focus. <laughs> so, Mark, you got a final four for the NCAA? Yeah, so I like, uh, I, I like the Denver Pioneers. I'm, I'm really high on them. Uh, I like the Johns Hopkins Blue Jays with all their veteran talent. I think they're looking good. I, I think what Connor was talking about earlier in the show with, with the Duke Blue Devils being able to figure things out, I think they got a veteran attack returning and a veteran defense. That bodes well for them, and then I'm thinking a uh, you know you gotta you gotta pick somebody a little out of the box. Nobody's talking about them yet because their season starts a little later. But the Cornell Big Red coming back with uh, with Rob Pinnell, you know they got they got some uh, some uh, some uh, elder leadership in the goal and, and on D. Uh, you know I think I think that those are four pretty solid teams. Mark, we only had one team in common. Really? Who was that? Denver. Oh, so who were your other three? Because I totally got cut. Yeah, Loyola, Maryland, and Notre Dame. Oh, see, I kind of slept on Notre Dame. I, I like Notre Dame a lot. I, I think that they have tons of potential, um, no question. Maryland, um, you know, they're interesting. They, they've kind of got, you know, they've been able to sneak by. I mean, look, they're a team that came from being unseated to the to the final game, so no question, uh, you know, they, they could certainly get there. Yeah, those are three great picks. I don't know about Loyola repeating, repeating. I think we lost Mark again, but totally possible. I was going to tell him we, that we can that, address his point, though. Anyways, yeah. I think Loyola actually did improve. Uh, they have more depth this year. They got a couple new guys in. Um, I think they're going to be running a couple higher numbers of players. So uh, Loyola, I think, is going to be all right. They got lucky last year not to get uh, any any serious injuries. So I think that they're going to try and beef up their uh, beef up their depth a little bit this year in case that does happen. So I like them. And it looks like Mark's back with us. Mark, you back? I hope so. Yeah, yeah, Mark's back. 
And it looks like we got a request from the audience to if you could keep it PG, Mark. So wait, you, you don't want you don't want tickets to this? None of this? <laughs> oh man, it's a good thing we're on YouTube, right? All right, let's see. We got we got one here. It's another gear question. I think maybe we'll we'll take this as our uh, our, our last kind of gear question. But favorite gloves of all time? Anybody have any? L thirty threes, floating cuff, gotta be. Yeah, I, don't know. I have no idea what those are. Brian L thirty threes, you know what? You you came to the game a little later, but these came out probably around two thousand, maybe ninety nine. They were just, I mean, they, they were obviously out before that, but I like the version from nineteen ninety nine, two thousand. Fantastic gloves, come a little higher on the hand, but like you know, they're not. They're not as tight to the hand as the as the gloves you see now, like the Kings or you know some of these other gloves that are just super tight to your hand. Yeah, I really like that kind of floating style. Connor, you know the ones with the with the curved thumb. Mark can't oh, see, yeah. but everybody else can. Yeah, it had like a, a the foam was curved on your thumb. It was awesome. Our coach back in the day, he used to. You know, this guy was so paranoid. He'd make us paint our thumbs white with white out so that when you were running down the field and practically encouraging us to thumb the ball so that the ref wouldn't be able to tell the difference. This was my empire coach because he figured that Long Island and upstate were doing the same thing, so we might as well get an advantage for New York City. There you go. You know, wow. Escalating warfare, that's the way to do it. Hey, you got to do what it takes, man. We had a pair of gloves in college. I don't even remember what they were called. They were brine gloves, and this finger was white, red, white, Red. No, they were kind oh, the of mixed. Defs. the defs. No, no, they were the next one after the deft. They made them for like one year. I don't know. Yeah, I they know were, what you're talking about. They were great. They were great. Ventilator X's or something. I don't know. Some awful name, but they were they were solid gloves. Yeah. How about how about lacrosse gear names? What's your favorite non-offensive lacrosse gear <laughs> name? <laughs> Oh, man. I'll have to think about that. Maybe, yeah, you know, right? I was very confused when I first started playing because I think uh, my first glove was like a, a Warrior Super Freak or something. Right. And I was like, yeah, what, is, what, are these, <laughs> yeah, what are these names? Like the Mac Daddy, Super Freak, uh, tons of different names. So I don't know. I have to think about that for a second. You got one? I, I've actually talked to Warrior about that. I'm, I'm convinced that they have like a bunch of 12-year-old boys working, working in their marketing <laughs> department. It's kind of ridiculous. Um, man, the best, the best name. Wow. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah, maybe the Cryptolite. You know, I, I kind of love all these shafts where they come up with these crazy names. You know, that that don't necessarily involve the element itself. Um, it, you know, that that are just kind of out there, like the uh, the katana. I mean, as if it like you know mimics the sword or like the ice or you know the Cryptolite. All these kind of crazy shaft names. Connor. I'd have to go with the STX Professor, but that's oh, all I can yes. do. I'm a huge and one fan. <laughs> no, I mean, at least somebody's paying a little homage to the academic side of things. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. It's got to be the Wesleyan guy, of course. I know it. So, yeah, it looks like we, I mean, looks like that kind of concludes our, our rapid fire. We have about five minutes left in the show right now, so you guys can ask away any other Questions you have, um, I know uh, it, a lot of you are watching that Bruins Rangers game. Uh, if we can get an update on that, that'd be great. Looks like Throne Joe from Throne of String is with us as well. He says, "Connor, you are correct on the Brian Ventilator X gloves." Yes, I, my memory actually served me correctly. And you know what? I wanted to bring up that's a great helmet, Connor. But I wanted to bring up something now that Joe's here that Bruins I saw. Glove. Ruins wanted, yellow, Mark. Right in your, you can't see it, but it's yellow. Yeah, don't worry, Connor. Two nothing Rangers, baby. <laughs> we still got some number of minutes left to play. That's okay. So, Connor, I wanted to ask you. You know, now that Joe's here, a little bit about a video I saw recently about the Brotherhood. I think it's called. Um, that was pretty cool. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, we uh, we basically were driving home from box lacrosse games on Saturdays and had some uh, woolly and wild conversations in the car. Uh, Joe has a wonderful uh, 79 jalopy 
uh, which is just a great car to, to ride home from games in. So on the way back to Brooklyn from Manhattan, we'd kind of talk, and it was born from that. Uh, we brought in a couple other guys uh, from the, the Throne Nation, the Throne Army, and uh, the rest is history. We film in a sketchy basement in Bushwick. <laughs> yeah, it looked like a cool... Uh, Keep it in the hood, baby. No, cool it's cool. It's cool. We actually got these Cheez-Its before we were filming, and they tasted like plastic. Huh. It was literally the worst thing I've ever eaten in my entire life. Great story, dude. Yeah, it was cool. I tried. Now you know. Now you know. Mark is Mark is bringing the heat tonight. He's got the the new haircut. He's got the V neck. He's really bringing it tonight. I mean, this is this is what you get. I mean, I'm sorry, Samir. We don't we don't know each other long enough, but you know, I, I try to bring a little levity to the situation. I love it. I love it. You're bringing the heat. Hey, if you can't handle the heat, get out of the kitchen, right? Yeah. All right, that one. Hey, uh, Connor, you, you got any line on uh, on any of the games this weekend? You want to you want to talk some uh, some predictions? Can we take it there for a sec? Yeah, let's um, let's see. Sh- what we shall got. I go to the internet and yeah. and see what's what? Let's see what we got going down. No, I'm I'm beating you to it already. Oh, nice. Yeah. Black I do. Box. Hey, why don't you talk for a second about that helmet? Is that a new Easton box? A little little unveil here? Did I did I push the envelope too far? I don't know if it's new, but it is Easton. Um, it's yellow. It's a weird color of yellow that I'm personally very much a fan of. It's like that deep Boston Bruins yellow. It's beautiful. Um, yeah, it's it's not yeah. quite Boston Boston College gold, but it's okay. It's not quite that ostentatious. <laughs> the Boston College gold. But no, are we, are we going to see that at the uh, at, at the box game up in Syracuse in, in a couple days? It's certainly possible. One thing you're definitely going to see are these uh, Rhino socks. Oh, those are sweet. I have those. Yeah, I'm digging those. We're, that's on the back. We're rocking these uh, rocking these in our game. That's all we can show you for now. We get some we get some amazing uh, uniforms to unveil as well. So, Mark, let's run through some games real quick. Uh, Bellarmine, yeah. Michigan. Uh, you know, I, I dogged on them before, but uh, but I am a huge Michigan fan. I'm, I'm going with the Wolverines in that one, even though Bellarmine took out a great team and Robert Morris before. I, I think realistically Bellarmine will take that, but I'm going Michigan. All right. Yeah, I think Bellarmine's going to take that. I think they're still they're still there and ready to go. Bryant, Fairfield. Don't sleep on Fairfield. Don't you dare. No, don't sleep. sleep. Don't sleep on Fairfield at all. Coach Copeland has got a great thing going up there. You know, the one thing I will say – uh, Bryant being able to get that first game of the season out of the way against a quality opponent in Colgate and, and taking them to the max. You know, I don't, I don't think either of us can really jump off the Bryant bandwagon just yet, so I'm going to go with Bryant. Yeah, I'm going to copy and paste your sentiments and jump right in on that, Bryant. Mm-hmm. Uh, it could be a good game, though. Uh, no, agreed. Agreed. Can't see Loyola losing to Delaware, although weirder things have happened. What about Duke-Notre Dame? Oh, wow. That's a great one. Um I'm going Notre Dame. Why not? As much as I hate Notre Dame being a Boston College guy, a little holy war there, uh, you know, I, I think that they're poised for, for big things this year. Um, you know, they, they could definitely take this one, no question. All right. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm going to echo that again. I think Duke has, uh, you know, they tend to kind of stumble a little bit at the beginning. It's not really a stumble when you're losing to teams like Denver or Notre Dame, but I'm with you on that. I, I like Notre Dame to pull it out. Um, one thing, the one thing I would like to say about that game is they pointed out after the game against Denver, Tierney was talking about how aggressive and fast and big the, the Duke defense is. So if they were able to kind of really capitalize on their matchups, that Notre Dame attack, which is probably going to feature a freshman in Kavanaugh and, you know, uh, a, a couple other guys that aren't necessarily, uh, you know, big dudes, they, they might be kind of shying away from contact a little bit. So that if, if the Duke D is able to have their way, that could definitely go uh, go different than how we're predicting. Yeah, it's possible. I think with the new rules, people are very uh, cognizant of being a little easy on the overly physical play. So it's going to yeah. be interesting to see, though, for sure. What about UMass and uh, North Carolina? Wow. Yeah, um, that should be a really good game. That's going to be a great game. I wish that was on TV. I'd love to see that. I got to go Carolina there. You know, I, I think that they have too many offensive weapons. You know, Carolina's a team. Their defense still has to gel, but they, I, I can't go against the heels. Come on. All right. I'm going with UMass. I think uh, I think their goalie is going to settle in more and more. He's a freshman, Al Cavallari. He's going to get better and better. He's going to be a stud. So. Uh, yeah, Oliveri's looking good. Yeah, I'm picking UMass. Uh, slight upset there. We got to go. 
Last pick I think we're going to talk about. It was a great game last year. Virginia, kind of rebuilding a little bit. Drexel, possibly the best 500 team in the country last year. Who you got? Virginia Drexel. Who's, baby? No question. Got to go with the who's here. The big thing for me, though, Drexel, I got too many guys coming off of injury. They got Trezano, who's hurt, and they got, what's his name, Church, who was in that terrible car accident. I mean, it it sucks that they're not going to be able to affect the game. But, you know, I I think if Drexel was at 100%, they'd give Virginia a run again. But I got to go with the who's, even though they got a lot of question marks. Yeah, I think that Virginia is going to reload. You know, they're they're just one of those teams right now. So I like them early. Uh, But it should be a heck of a game. I think it'll probably come down to – you know, that last possession or overtime, it's certainly possible. Yeah, I think that'll be a nice up-and-down game, too. Both those teams will like to push it a little bit. Yeah, got some good athletes. Samir, we got any uh, quick questions to finish up, or how we doing? Let me check it out. How we doing, Tony Reale? How about Hartford versus Maryland is a big question in all caps from Jared Rubin. Wow. I mean, Maryland? Yeah, I, I got to say Maryland, but I do like what, what Hartford has been doing in recent years. You know, they've been known for bringing in some great Canadians. Tracy Kaluski played there. Uh, you know, they had Cudmore last year. Don't sleep do on, uh, on the Hartford Hawks. Yeah, yeah, they do a lot more with less uh, up there. I mean, they don't get a ton of support, but they make it work. Um, got to go with Maryland in this game, though. I mean, I think they're yeah. well suited to the new rules. They got the depth. They got athletes. They got coaching. Uh, they're there. You know, hard hard to pick against the Terps, especially after you see what they did to uh, Mount St. Mary's, which is a pretty good team uh, today. Absolutely destroyed them. Oh, really? Did they? I didn't see that before we went on. Man, that's oh, not yeah. good. No, it was it was a rough one. <laughs> yeah, they're chomping at the bit. I mean, especially after two straight losses in the, in the championship game, I would not want to get in the University of Maryland's way this year. They're going to be – a mean physical team playing real fast, or hopefully playing real fast. So, you know, look out for that buzzsaw. Yeah, no question about it. So, well, with that, you know, I think we're done, right? So, do, do I pull a mic? Not done until you take that helmet off. <laughs> I don't, I don't quite have Mike Powell uh, quickness, but you know, I'm working on. It. I'm training. It's all in the core. That's what he says. That's what he says. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hey, we'll be back next week. Mark Powers, Samir, they'll be joining me again, obviously. We're pleased to have them. Maybe next week we'll even bring a guest on. We're hearing uh, J.R. Reskovich is interested. Maybe we'll get that cat. He's a good dude to talk some lacrosse with. Excellent. Yeah, otherwise, thanks <laughs> everybody for tuning in. Yeah, keep yes, the questions coming, guys. We, we, we love those lightning rounds. Exactly. So we'll be I'll back next week. I'll try to keep my shirt on. 8 p.m. Tuesday night next week. We'll see you guys. Thanks for tuning in.